something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. Professor Quirrell's office hours consisted of 11.40 to 11.55 a.m. on Thursday. That was for all his students in all years. It cost a Quirrell point just to knock on the door, and if he didn't think your reason was worth his time, you would lose another 50. Harry knocked on the door. There was a pause. I suppose you may as well come in, Mr. Potter. And before Harry could touch the doorknob, the door slammed open, hitting the wall with a sharp crack that sounded like something might have broken in the wood, or the stone, or both. I am not in a good mood, Mr. Potter, and when I am not in a good mood, I am not a pleasant person to be around. For your own sake, conduct your business quickly and depart. Is there anything I can do to help? I mean, if you've been dealing with idiots and want someone sane to talk to... There was a surprisingly long pause. I suppose an intelligent conversation would be pleasant for me at this point. You are not likely to find it so, be warned. I promise I won't mind if you snap at me. What happened? The cold in the room seemed to deepen. A sixth-year Gryffindor cast a curse at one of my more promising students, a sixth-year Slytherin. What sort of curse? Why bother to ask an unimportant question like that, Mr. Potter? Our friend the sixth-year Gryffindor did not think it was important. Are you serious? No, I'm in a terrible mood today for no particular reason. Yes, I'm serious, you fool. He didn't know. He actually didn't know. I didn't believe it until the Aurors confirmed it under Veritaserum. He is in his sixth year at Hogwarts, and he cast a high-level dark curse without knowing what it did. You don't mean that he was mistaken about what it did, that he somehow read the wrong spell description. All he knew was that it was meant to be directed at an enemy. He knew that was all he knew. I do not understand how anything with that small a brain could walk upright. Indeed, Mr. Potter. Was the sixth year Slytherin seriously hurt? Yes. Was the sixth year Gryffindor raised by muggles? Yes. Is Dumbledore refusing to expel him because the poor boy didn't know? Do you have a point, Mr. Potter, or are you just stating the obvious? Professor Quirrell, all the Muggle race students in Hogwarts need a safety lecture, in which they are told of things so ridiculously obvious that no wizardborn would ever think to mention them. Don't cast curses if you don't know what they do. If you discover something dangerous, don't tell the world about it. Don't brew high-level potions without supervision in a bathroom. The reason why there are underage magic laws. All the basics. Why? Let the stupid ones die before they breed. If you don't mind losing a few sixth-year Slytherins along with them. You're not running away. If you're about to say you're not scared of me, don't. You are the scariest person I know, and one of the top reasons for that is your control. I simply can't imagine hearing that you'd hurt someone you had not made a deliberate decision to hurt. You say the nicest things, Mr. Potter. Have you been taking lessons in flattery? From, perhaps, Mr. Malfoy? Harry kept his expression blank and realized one second too late that it might as well have been a signed confession. 
Professor Quirrell didn't care what your expression looked like, he cared which states of mind made it likely. I see. Mr. Malfoy is a useful friend to have, Mr. Potter, and there is much he can teach you. But I hope you have not made the mistake of trusting him with too many confidences. He knows nothing which I fear becoming known. Well done. I suppose you are right. I shall design a lecture to ensure that Muggleborns who are too stupid to live do not take anyone valuable with them as they depart. So, what was your original business here? I think I'm done with the preliminary exercises in occlumency and ready for the tutor. I shall conduct you to Gringotts this Sunday. He paused, looking at Harry, and smiled. And we might even make it a little outing, if you like. I've just had a pleasant thought. Harry nodded, smiling back. As Harry left the office, he heard Professor Quirrell humming a small tune. Harry was glad he'd been able to cheer him up. That Sunday, there seemed to be a rather large number of people whispering in the hallways, at least when Harry Potter walked past them, and a lot of pointed fingers, and a great deal of female giggling. It had started at breakfast when someone had asked Harry if he'd heard the news, and Harry had quickly interrupted and said that if the news was written by Rita Skeeter, then he didn't want to hear about it, he wanted to read it in the paper himself. It had then developed that not many students at Hogwarts got copies of the Daily Prophet, and that the copies which had not already been bought up from their owners were being passed around in some sort of complicated order, and nobody really knew who had one at the moment. He'd done homework in the safety of his trunk for the next couple of hours, after telling his doormates to come get him if anyone found him an original newspaper. Harry was feeling rather curious, but it really wouldn't have done to spoil the artistry by hearing it secondhand. Harry was still ignorant at 10 a.m. when he'd left Hogwarts with Professor Quirrell. We're outside the wards, Mr. Potter. Time to go. Harry was wondering exactly how they'd get there when Professor Quirrell said, Catch! and threw a bronze knut at him, and Harry caught it without thinking. A giant, intangible hook caught at Harry's abdomen and yanked him back, hard, only without any sense of acceleration, and an instant later, Harry was standing in the middle of Diagon Alley. Excuse me, what? said his brain. We just teleported, explained Harry. That didn't used to happen in the ancestral environment, Harry's brain complained, and disoriented him. Moments later, there was a sort of sucking-popping sound from a few paces behind Harry, and when Harry turned to look, Professor Quirrell was there. I need to go off and set something in motion, Mr. Potter. As it has been thoroughly explained to me that I am responsible for anything whatsoever that happens to you, I'll be leaving you with... Newsstand! Or anywhere I can buy a copy of the Daily Prophet. Put me there, and I'll be happy. Shortly after, Harry had been delivered into a bookstore, accompanied by several quietly spoken, ambiguous threats. And the shopkeeper had gotten less ambiguous threats, judging by the way he cringed, and how his eyes now kept darting between Harry and the entrance. If the bookstore burned down, Harry was going to stick around in the middle of the fire until Professor Quirrell got back. Pardon me. One copy of the Daily Prophet, please. Five sickles. Sorry, kid. I've only got three left. Harry had the feeling he could have bargained him down a couple of points, but at this point he didn't really care. The shopkeeper's eyes widened and he seemed to really notice Harry for the first time. You! Is it true? Are you really? Shut up! Sorry. I've been waiting all day to read this in the original newspaper instead of hearing about it secondhand. So please just hand it over, all right? The shopkeeper stared at Harry for a moment, then wordlessly reached under the counter and passed over one folded copy of the Daily Prophet. The headline read, Harry Potter secretly betrothed to Genevieve Weasley. Harry stared. He lifted the newspaper off the counter, softly, reverently, like he was handling an original Escher artwork, and unbent it to read about the evidence that had convinced Rita Skeeter, and some interesting further details, and yet more evidence. Fred and George had cleared it with their sister first, surely? Yes, of course they had. There was a picture of Geneva Weasley that had to have been staged. But how on earth? Harry was rereading the newspaper for the fourth time when the door whispered softly and Professor Quirrell came back into the shop. My apologies for... What in Merlin's name are you reading? It would seem that one Mr. Arthur Weasley was placed under the imperious curse by a Death Eater whom my father killed, thus creating a debt to the noble House of Potter, which my father demanded be repaid by the hand in marriage of the recently born Geneva Weasley. How could Miss Skeeter possibly be fool enough to believe... And Professor Quirrell's voice cut off. Don't worry, it's all fake. Mr. Potter... Are you sure of that? 
Miss Skeeter viewed the original proceedings of the restricted Wizengomet session. The original proceedings of the Wizengomet. I would have trouble doing that. Really? Because if my suspicions are correct, this was done by a Hogwarts student. That is beyond impossible. Mr. Potter, I regret to say that this young lady expects to marry you. It is unimaginable that the Grand Master of Gringotts should have fixed the seal of his office in witness of a false betrothal contract. And Miss Skeeter personally verified that seal. Indeed. You would expect the Grand Master of Gringotts to get involved with that much money changing hands. It seems Mr. Weasley was greatly in debt, and so demanded an additional payment of 10,000 galleons. 10,000 galleons? For a Weasley? You could buy a daughter of a noble house for that! Excuse me, I really have to ask at this point, do people actually do that sort of thing around here? Rarely. And not at all, I suspect, since the Dark Lord departed. I suppose that according to the newspaper, your father just paid it? He didn't have any choice. Not if he wanted to fulfill the conditions of the prophecy. That prophecy didn't sound quite right to me, either. The centaurs could have been put under an Imperius. That seems understandable. What magic can make, magic can corrupt, and it is not unthinkable that the Great Seal of Gringotts could be twisted to another's hand. The Unspeakable could have been impersonated with Polyjuice, likewise the Bavarian Seer. And with enough effort, it might be possible to tamper with the proceedings of the Wizengomet. Do you have any idea how that was done? I do not have one single plausible hypothesis. I do know it was done on a total budget of 40 galleons. Forty galleons will pay a competent wardbreaker to open a path into a home you wish to burglarize. Forty thousand galleons might pay a team of the greatest professional criminals in the world to tamper with the proceedings of the Wizengomet. I'll remember that the next time I want to save 39,960 galleons by finding the right contractor. I do not say this often. I am impressed. And who is this incredible Hogwarts student? I'm afraid I couldn't say. Somewhat to Harry's surprise, Professor Quirrell made no objection to this. They walked in the direction of the Gringotts building, thinking, for they were neither of them the sort of person who would give up on the problem without considering it for at least five minutes. I have a feeling that we're coming at this from the wrong angle. There's a tale I once heard about some students who came into a physics class, and the teacher showed them a large metal plate near a fire. She ordered them to feel the metal plate, and they felt that the metal nearer the fire was cooler, and the metal further away was warmer. And she said, write down your guess for why this happens. So some students wrote down, because of how the metal conducts heat. And some students wrote down, because of how the air moves. And no one said, this just seems impossible. And the real answer was that before the students came into the room, the teacher turned the plate around. Interesting. That does sound similar. Is there a moral? That your strength as a rationalist is your ability to be more confused by fiction than by reality. If you're equally good at explaining any outcome, you have zero knowledge. The students thought they could use words like because of heat conduction to explain anything, even a metal plate being cooler on the side nearer the fire. So they didn't notice how confused they were, and that meant they couldn't be more confused by falsehood than by truth. If you tell me that the centaurs were under the imperious curse, I still have the feeling of something being not quite right. I notice that I'm still confused even after hearing your explanation. I don't suppose that it's possible to actually swap people into alternate universes? Like, this isn't our own Rita Skeeter, or they temporarily sent her somewhere else? If that was possible, would I still be here? Ah, of course. I see it now. Let me guess. The Weasley twins. What? How? I'm afraid I couldn't say. That is not fair! I think it is extremely fair. The first part of the mission, to find an Occlumency instructor, had been a success. Professor Quirrell, smiling evilly, had told Griphook to recommend the best he knew and not worry about the expense, since Dumbledore was paying it, and the Goblin had smiled in return. There might have been a certain amount of smiling on Harry's part as well. The second part of the plan had been a complete failure. Harry was not allowed to take money out of his vault without Headmaster Dumbledore or some other school official present, and Professor Quirrell had not been given the vault key. Harry's muggle parents could not authorize it because they were muggles, and muggles had around the same legal standing as children or kittens. They were cute, so if you tortured them in public you could get arrested, but they weren't people. 
Some reluctant provision had been made for recognizing the parents of Muggleborns as human in a limited sense, but Harry's adoptive parents did not fall into that legal category. It seemed that Harry was effectively an orphan in the eyes of the wizarding world. As such, the headmaster of Hogwarts, or his designees within the school system, were Harry's guardians until he graduated. Harry could breathe without Dumbledore's permission, but only so long as the headmaster did not specifically prohibit it. Harry had then asked if he could simply tell Griphook how to diversify his investments beyond stacks of gold coins sitting in his vault. Griphook had stared blankly and asked what diversify meant. Banks, it seemed, did not make investments. Banks stored your gold coins in secure vaults for an annual fee. The Wizarding World did not have a concept of stock, or equity, or corporations. Businesses were run by families out of their personal vaults. Loans were made by rich people, not banks. Though Gringotts would witness the contract for a fee, and enforce its collection for a much larger fee. Good rich people let their friends borrow money and pay it back whenever. Bad rich people charged you interest. There was no secondary market in loans. Evil rich people charged you annual interest rates of at least 20%. Harry had asked if he needed the headmaster's permission before he could start a bank. Professor Quirrell had interrupted at this point, saying that it was time for lunch, and swiftly conducted a fuming Harry out of the bronze doors of Gringotts, through Diagon Alley, and to a fine restaurant called Mary's Place, where a room had been reserved for them. The owner had looked shocked at seeing Professor Quirrell accompanied by Harry Potter, but had conducted them to the room without complaint. And Professor Quirrell had deliberately announced that he would pay the bill, seeming to rather enjoy the look on Harry's face. No, we will not require menus. I will have the daily special, accompanied by a bottle of Chianti, and Mr. Potter will have the Duracall soup to start, followed by a plate of Rupu balls and treacle pudding for dessert. The waitress bowed respectfully and departed, shutting the door behind her. This room, Mr. Potter, is known as Mary's room. It happens to be proof against all scrying, and I do mean all. Dumbledore himself could detect nothing of what happens here. Mary's room is used by two kinds of people. The first sort are engaged in illicit dalliances, and the second sort lead interesting lives. Really? It would be a waste to just sit here and eat lunch, then, without doing anything special. Professor Quirrell grinned, then took out his wand and flicked it in the direction of the door. Of course, people who lead interesting lives take precautions more thorough than the dalliers. I have just sealed us in. Nothing will now pass in or out of this room, through the crack under the door, for example. And... Professor Quirrell then spoke no fewer than four different charms, none of which Harry recognized. Even that does not really suffice. If we were doing anything of truly great import, it would be necessary to perform another 23 checks besides those. If, say, Rita Skeeter knew or guessed that we would come here, it is possible that she could be in this room wearing the true cloak of invisibility. Or she could be an animagus with a tiny form, perhaps. There are tests to rule out such rare possibilities, but to perform all of them would be arduous. Still, I wonder if I should do them anyway, just so as not to teach you bad habits. It's fine. I understand, and I'll remember. Though he was a little disappointed that they weren't doing anything of truly great import. Very well. You wrought quite well today, Mr. Potter. The basic notion was yours, I'm sure, even if you delegated the execution. I don't think we'll be hearing much more from Rita Skeeter after this. Lucius Malfoy will not be pleased with her failure. If she's smart, she'll flee the country the instant she realizes she's been fooled. Lucius was behind Rita Skeeter? Oh, you didn't realize that. Harry hadn't thought about what would happen to Rita Skeeter afterward. At all. Not in the slightest. But she would get fired from her job. Of course she would be fired. She might have children going through Hogwarts for all Harry knew. And now it was worse. Much worse. Is Lucius gonna have her killed? If you have not dealt with journalists before, take it from me that the world gets a little brighter every time one dies. Sit down! No, Lucius won't kill her. But Lucius makes life extremely unpleasant for those who serve him ill. Miss Skeeter will flee and start her life over with a new name. Sit down, Mr. Potter. There is nothing you can do at this point, and you have a lesson to learn. Harry sat down, slowly. There was a disappointed, annoyed look on Professor Quirrell's face that was doing more to stop him than the words. There are times when I worry that your brilliant Slytherin mind is simply wasted on you. Repeat after me. Rita Skeeter was a vile, disgusting woman. Rita Skeeter was a vile, disgusting woman. 
He wasn't comfortable saying it, but there didn't seem to be any other possible actions. None at all. Rita Skeeter tried to destroy my reputation, but I executed an ingenious plan and destroyed her reputation first. Rita Skeeter challenged me. She lost the game, and I won. Rita Skeeter was an obstacle to my future plans. I had no choice but to deal with her if I wanted those plans to succeed. Rita Skeeter was my enemy. I cannot possibly get anything done in life if I am not willing to defeat my enemies. I have defeated one of my enemies today. I am a good boy. I deserve a special reward. Ah, I see I have succeeded in catching your attention. Professor Quirrell reached into his robes, the gesture slow and deliberately significant, and drew forth... A book. What is it? A diary. Whose? That of a famous person. Mr. Potter, one of the requisites for becoming a powerful wizard is an excellent memory. The key to a puzzle is often something you read 20 years ago in an old scroll, or a peculiar ring you saw on the finger of a man you met only once. I mentioned this to explain how I managed to remember this item and the placard attached to it after meeting you a good deal later. You see, Mr. Potter, over the course of my life, I have viewed a number of private collections held by individuals who are, perhaps, not quite deserving of all that they have. You stole it? That is correct. Very recently, in fact. I think you will appreciate this particular item much more than the vile little man who held it for no other purpose than impressing his equally vile friends with its rarity. But if you feel that my actions were incorrect, Mr. Potter, I suppose you needn't accept your special present. Though, of course, I shan't go to the trouble of stealing it back. So, which is it to be? No! Yes! What part of the word book did you two not understand? The theft part. Oh, come on! You can't seriously ask us to say no and spend the rest of our life wondering what it was. It sounds like a net positive from a utilitarian standpoint. Think of it as an economic transaction which generates gains from trade, only without the trade part. Plus, we didn't steal it, and it won't help anyone to have Professor Quirrell keep it. He's trying to turn you dark! Don't be a naive little boy. He's trying to teach you Slytherin. Yeah, whoever owned the book originally was probably a Death Eater or something. It belongs with us. There came a knock at the door. The book vanished back into Professor Quirrell's robes, and he rose up from his chair. Professor Quirrell started walking over to the door, and staggered, suddenly lurching into the wall. It's all right. It's just a dizzy spell. Professor Quirrell straightened then, his breathing seeming a bit heavy, and opened the door. The waitress came in bearing a platter of food, and as she distributed the plates, Professor Quirrell walked slowly back to the table. But by the time the waitress had bowed her way out, Professor Quirrell was sitting upright and smiling again. Still, the brief episode of whatever it was had decided Harry. He couldn't say no, not after Professor Quirrell had gone to that much trouble. Yes! Professor Quirrell held up a cautioning finger, then took out his wand again, locked the door again, and repeated three of the same charms from earlier. Harry opened the book with ingrained, instinctive care. The pages seemed too thick, with a texture unlike either muggle paper or wizarding parchment, and the contents were... blank? Am I supposed to be seeing... Look nearer the beginning. The lettering was obviously handwritten and very hard to read, but Harry thought the words might be in Latin. What is this? That is a record of the magical researches of a muggle-born who never came to Hogwarts. He refused his letter and conducted his own small investigations, which never did get very far without a wand. From the description on the placard, I expect that his name bears rather more significance to you than to me. That, Harry Potter, is the diary of Roger Bacon. Harry almost fainted. Nestled up against the wall, where Professor Quirrell had stumbled, glistened the crushed remains of a beautiful blue beetle.